Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank you for this morning. We ask that you will bless your children, that you bless everyone in this sanctuary, that let everyone find purpose and meaning. Let every heart, Lord, know you. Let every spirit realign to you, the giver of life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hallelujah. I am so excited to be here one more time, amen. And like I always say, every time I have the opportunity to stand behind any pulpit, it is a moment of gratitude. Amen. First to God and second for the pulpit owner. Amen. Hallelujah. It is a place of trust. And I do not take it lightly at all. It is a place of trust. So every one of you, anytime any man gives you the opportunity to stand behind a pulpit, know that, acknowledge that it is a place of trust. God trusts him and he trusts you, which means that God trusts you to deliver that word. So I am always grateful to God. And I want to thank Reverend Lloyd and his wife, you know, for, for everything, for everything. Amen and amen. He's a good, good man. And those who know me, you know I don't say certain things lightly. Words like perfect and all those things are not in my vocabulary. Amen. It takes extraordinary for me to go that. But he's a good, good man. And I just want to thank God for him in my life. And at a point in which I met him, it was so prophetic. So I will forever be grateful. Amen and amen. The mark of a great man is, is not how much wealth he acquires for himself, but it is how much he is able to bring out gifts out of people. It is how much he is able to raise other people. It's, it's, it's how much he takes on. I hear him call to make out my daughter, my daughter all the time. Amen. And even though you may not be his biological daughter, I know in his heart he sees you as a daughter. And he will probably treat you no less than any of his daughters. So that's the mark of a great man. Amen. All right. Now let's go to the word of God. I'll be brief. I'll be quick. Hallelujah. There is something I want to share with you. When God calls every man, he gives that man passion. He gives that man, that man a reason for why he called him. Amen. We'll see that as we go along. So there are a lot of passions in my heart. There are things that I am most passionate about. When I'm talking to people at work or my friends or other fellow pastors or ministers, there are things that I am passionate about. I am passionate about social justice. I am passionate about, you know, um, the people of God not just being deceived. Amen. I am passionate about the truth. When a man of God stands on a pulpit or when a man of God is leading people or when a leader is leading a nation, the amount of truth they say, these are things that anger me in my spirit. These are things that just go to the core of my being. And I know those are the things that God wants me to talk about all the time. Amen. Now, I am also very saddened and very passionate about the children of God walking in their authority. Amen. So, when you have that power or when God places in you that gift or God gives you the ability for you to be able, say, to drag let me say a 25-ton vehicle but then, all of your life, you've been dragging a 10-pound vehicle. That is an underutilization of God's trust on you. Amen. And it angers me to my core. So every time I see young men or every time I stand behind a pulpit, I make it a point that, listen, the children of God or as a child of God, you need to recognize, you need to walk in your full glory and walk in your full potential. Amen. Amen. And then today my title, I am entitling the Walking His Will. Amen. Walking the will of God. I did not say walking in His will. Amen. Even though they are close, I say walking His will. So this is what I needed to picture. I needed to picture an area or a path or a geographical area where there is an intricate weaving. Either it could be a straight line. 
It could be a line that goes up the mountain and a line that is never broken, a line that has a beginning and has an end. Amen and amen. It could take you through the desert. It could take you through the waters. It could take you through, through, through the mountains. But that line never stops. That road is carved carefully between all of this, meandering all around. But God created that path and God created that line. And God expects you, or what God is looking for, is for you as a man to follow that path carefully, cautiously, from the beginning to the end. Amen and amen. But then, here's a story. When God made you, when God made man, and I would always go back to, the, to Genesis, to the beginning of creation, because the beginning of a thing, the creation of a thing, spells what that thing was meant for. So when God created man, the original intent of God was not for God to walk his will. Amen. It was for, it was for man to dwell in his will. It was for man to dwell in his ability. It was for man to enjoy the comfort of God himself. Amen. Because when God made man, God made man in his own image and put him in the garden. God had done everything for him. Man was the last piece of creation. So all God wanted man to do was for man to enjoy the garden. Was for man to just stay there. No work. Don't do anything. Just do what I asked you to do and I, God, will come. I will supply all your needs. I will provide everything that you need. Your sustenance is on me. Your, your growth is on me. Your, everything you have is on me. So I was going to take care of man. Amen. You following? That was why God made man. God did not make man to be a workhorse. God did not create you to be a workforce. God did not create you to actually become a doctor. Amen and amen. God did not create man to be a lawyer. God did not create man to be a soldier. God did not create man to be, to be anything. Amen. Follow me. Listen. So God did not create you to do what you're doing right now. That wasn't his purpose for you. His purpose for you was for fellowship. God created you so that he could have a friend. He could have a friend who could come down and say, listen, what are we doing today? Let's walk in the garden. Let's have communion. Amen. Let's, let's enjoy one another. That was why God created you. God created you because God needed somewhat of an equal. So when God breathed his life into you, what God did was that God took himself and put it into you. So that when God is dealing with you, God knew that he was dealing with an equal. Amen. Are you following? No, 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 you're not following. When God created you and breathed his life into you, what God did was that God transferred his own self into you. So that you would think like God. You can talk like God. You can create things like God. When you speak things into existence, it will come into existence. When you say stop, the mountains will stop. When you say come nigh, the mountains will come out. So when God created you, God put his the same creative ability that was in him from day one to day six. God put that same creative ability inside of you. That is why it angers my spirit. When some people will still be chasing other men of God and say, men of God, lay your hands on me or else this situation is not going to get better. You see, when you do that, what you are doing is that you are underestimating the power of God inside of you. It's like you are saying to God, God, you made me less of a human being. God, you made me less of an impact. But that's not what God did. But something did that to you. Somebody did that to you. Some part of the process, some piece of the process did that to you. And that is what angers God the more. See, the problem is not a sin. The problem is not a fornication. The problem is not a stealing. That is not a problem. The problem is that when you engage in those things, what it does is that it forces God to move away from you. Because God is a holy God. So when, when a man sins, come on. You go and do something in some corner somewhere. Or in the secret of your bedroom. And you have all the pleasures of the flesh. You think God really cares about that? God doesn't care about that. But what, get, what God cares about is the fact that that act forces him, God, to move away from you. And when God moves away from you, what it does is that it robs you of the very life that God put into you. 
Because that life that God put into you has to be connected to him, God, for you to be able to live. So as long as there is a break between that connection between you and God, something is happening to you. There is a decay in your spirit. The process of rottenness begins in your life. And as long as you stay away from God, you begin to experience death. And as long as you begin to experience that death, the powers of God inside of you begin to diminish. And when the powers of God inside of you begin to diminish, you are not walking in a full life, in a full abundance, grace of God. Amen. Amen. So if you think that a little sin you're going to commit in a bedroom or something you're going to do out there, or if you think that's a problem, that's not a problem for God. After God made it for you. Amen and amen. God made it for you. Those who are married, they know what I mean. It was God who made it. When God made Eve, God did not make Eve a man. God made Eve a woman. There was a reason. And God made Eve different from Adam so that two of them could do certain things. Amen. So God did it for you. God created that process for you. He did not create it for himself. It was for your enjoyment. So when you do it, you enjoy. It doesn't bother God. But what bothers God is the fact that the things, some of the things that we do, some of the acts that we do, it pushes us away from him. And then it stops him, God, from being God in your life. And when God is not being God in your life, there has to be something else inside of your life that takes control over your life. So what it is, it is either yourself or that is when the enemy has opportunity to come into your life. And when the enemy comes into your life, the very first thing he attacks in your life is the will of God for what? For your life. Because as long as the enemy keeps you off the track of God, he's got you exactly where he wants to get you. Amen. You see, the funny thing is this. You don't need to be too far away from the will of God for you to be outside of the will of God. You can still walk right by the will of God and think that I am walking in the will of God. But what you're doing is that you're walking slightly outside the will of God. Amen. How many of you heard of Miles Monroe's Potential Principle? It was a principle I learned, I, I heard when I was, I think, 11 years old, and I've never forgotten. So, Mas Monroe, and I'll do this in two minutes, and we'll continue. Mas Monroe says that everything that was made on the earth, everything you see is matter. M A T T E R. And science will tell you that matter is anything that has what? Weight. And that's what? And occupies space. Man, your elementary teacher was good. Matter is anything that has space, so wait, and occupy space. So do you have matter inside of you? Yes. You carry weight, right? And you carry space. You have weight and you carry space, right? So there's a part of you which is matter. The earth that God used to make you is matter. Amen. This pulpit is matter, right? And at, and at the end of the day, everything that is made out of matter will return back to where it came from. Amen. Amen. You can recycle this glass as much as you want. It will go back into the earth. Because this glass came from the earth. Amen. Steel, every piece of steel, aluminum, it comes from where? The earth. It will go back where? Into the earth. Every piece of rubber, plastic, comes from where? The earth. It will go back where? Into the earth. Trees come from where? The earth. When you cut a tree, where does it go back to? Into the earth. Amen and amen. And the tree needs to remain on the earth for the tree to, to, to have life inside of it because the roots of the tree as well is where? Into the earth. So the life of the tree comes from the earth. Everything else comes from the earth. But there is one thing that does not come from the earth. And that is the life of God that he breathed inside of you. That is why the Bible says that when the life of God inside of you is dead, you are dead. When God takes that life outside of you, you are nothing more than this plastic or this chair or that piece of metal. You are going back where? Into the earth. Which means that for you to remain living on the face of the earth, you need to be what? You need to be connected to God. Because the thing that matters in your life is the life of God inside of you. So when a man is not connected to God, it means that the life of that man is dead. Or that man is dying slowly. 
You're just a piece of earth. Amen. 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 Two scriptures. One says, for the wages of sin is what? Listen carefully to this. For the wages of sin is what? Why is the Bible calling it the wage of sin? What is a wage? What happens? You need to work, right? To earn an A, to earn a wage. You need to go to a work. You need to do something for you to receive the wage. And a wage is what? It's what you are compensated. It is a compensation for the work that you put in. But the Bible is saying that the wages of your sin, which means that for you to actually work in sin, you have, you have to go to work. You need to do something. Something has to happen. You are working on it. It is either premeditated. You are planning on it. You are working on it. You make a conscious effort. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to go earn a wage. But listen to this. It says, but the gift of God is what? What is the gift of God? Through who? I was coming to trick you guys. I destroyed it. But the, but the gift of God is eternal life through whom? Through Christ Jesus. So what God was trying to do, or what scriptures is trying to say is that the gift of God is eternal life, which means that man was supposed to live eternally. And for man to live eternally, it means that man was not supposed to know any type of death. Because as long as you are alive, you are not dead. As long as you live, you will not die. You can live a thousand years, you will not die. As long as there is a life of God inside of you, your body and you know no death. That is why I know that when God made man in the beginning and God put that life inside of man, that life had nothing to do with death. It was eternal life. Man was supposed to live forever. But when man fell, you know, God could have said, man, you fell, you failed. You're done. I'm withdrawing you back from the mission. You failed your mission. But God said no. God said no. Maybe God said yes. Maybe God wanted to take man off the face of the earth completely. But there was something again inside of God. There was something inside of God that would not permit him to do that. There was something inside of God that would not permit God to go that extent of killing you. There was something inside of God that was stopping God himself from doing that. So when God gave the punishment, I call it the punishment of love. God didn't punish them to go and die. God punished them for them to go and live, but live a different kind of life. You know what? Every piece of work that you do on the face of this earth, every single one, every single work that you do on the face of this earth is a result of sin. I'll explain. Every profession, most professions that we love, that we place high value on, that we promote, that we want our kids to go after, that we ourselves, we want to chase, is a result of sin. Let me explain to you. Why do you need a doctor? Because you don't have divine health. Why don't you have divine health? Because you, dis because you disobeyed God and God took it away from you. Why do you need a lawyer? Because someone has committed a crime. Why are you committing a crime? Because your nature is sinful. Your falling nature is sinful. So you can't stop committing crime. So as long as you commit crime, we need to put you behind bars. Result of sin. Why do you need a pastor? Because of sin. Because their flock is lost. So you need a pastor to pasteurize them, to bring them back to the full grace of God. Why do you need a prophet? Because the life of God inside of you is gone. You can't hear God no more. The connection of God with you, which God is supposed to send you down nutrients as the branch connected to the vine. And God is supposed to be speaking to you. God is supposed to be giving you nutrients. You're supposed to be flourishing. More flowers, more green inside of you. You're supposed to be looking good day after day. That connection is gone. You, know, you have no more nutrients. 
So you need a prophet to come and tell, hey, 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 come back, come back, come back. God is telling you, don't go this way. Go back slightly up. Go back to your joint and join back to God. Every profession on the face of this earth is a, is a result of the fallen nature of man. Sin and evil. Why do we have public defenders? Because somebody is doing something against someone which is not right. So someone else has to go and say, no, I'm going to defend this guy. So that wasn't God's plan for you. So when God said man should go and till the land and eat, God was giving the man a different type of work, a different type of direction. You know what I was thinking when I was coming? I said, can you imagine if the time that we used to work, we used it to worship? Can you imagine if the time that we've used to attend a seven-year degree or an eight-year degree or a PhD is even more? Can you imagine if we spend that time in the presence of God worshiping? Can you imagine if the 40-hour week that you spend in some office behind a computer or whatever you're doing, can you imagine if that time is spent in the presence of God? So that is the fallen nature of man. That was what we did to ourselves. Amen and amen. But say there is hope. Amen. There is hope. Amen and amen. There is hope. But guess what? When God said man had sinned, I told you there was something inside of God that prevented him from killing you. You know what it was? It was the very life of God himself. Because the life of God was inside of you. So God cannot kill his own life. Amen. You cannot kill your own life. Somebody has to take it away from you. Amen. So, that part of God, that life of God, that grace of God, that, do you know that it takes God to forgive? Do you know it takes God, God to forgive? Do you know it takes God to show mercy? Do you know it takes kings to pardon? Do you know it takes presidents to give presidential pardons? So do you know that your ability to forgive or your ability to show compassion or your ability to say, I'm going to let this thing go, your ability to say, this is not going to hurt me anymore. Do you know that it is because you are a God, it is the God nature inside of you? Do you know that angels do not have that capability? That's why Lucifer doesn't have the capability to forgive because it is not inside of him. Amen. He was made like a robot. You were molded by God and the life of God was put inside of you. So there's a peace of God that is running around inside of you. When you're walking and you're going and you're coming, it is God inside of you because you are a God. Amen. You are a spirit. You are a whispering spirit. You are a powerful spirit. It is inside of you. Amen. So, to those of you who have no respect for yourself, I have news for you. I respect you, man. When I see you, I see a God that's coming. And that it's about time you begin to see yourself as a God. It's about time you begin to see yourself as that man with that ability to make things happen and to change situations. It's about time you begin to recognize the strength inside of you, the power inside of you. It's about time you begin to walk in the full dominion and the abundant life of God inside of you. As long as you live, there's a purpose for your life. As long as you are alive, there's a reason you are alive. As long as you live, it means that that same power is inside of you. Begin to cultivate it. In 10 minutes, I'll be done. Amen. Hallelujah. So, I've told you the powers of God inside of you that are dormant. And I've told you that there's a will of God for your life. And I've also told you that you fell as a man, but God didn't kill you. And when God did not kill you, God began a redemptive process. Amen. The process of restoration from the beginning of a man's life to the end of that man's life. From the life that we chose for ourselves. All God is doing with you. 
is that God is trying to bring you back to the beginning. God is bringing you back to the garden experience. God is trying to bring you back to that place where he can fellowship with you freely. God is bringing you back to the place where he, God, will be in charge of your life. God, all God is doing is bringing you back to the garden so that he, God, will become God of your life. Where you don't need to worry about anything because he, God, will take control of your problems. Where you don't need to worry about your bills because he, God, has got your back. Why you don't need to worry about sickness because with him you will have eternal life. You have divine healing. That is all God has been trying to do with your life. You know how you know why I know? Because Jesus Christ said, I think in John 10 10, what did he say? I'm interested in a B. John 10 10 verses B. The A says that for the teeth come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I'm not interested in that part for you today. The part I'm interested in for you is that he said what? That I have come that you may do what? You may have life and have it what? Abundantly. Not just life, but the abundant life of God. The abundant life of God is the life that when it's inside of you, you don't need to worry about anything. You don't need to worry about sin. It is the same life in the beginning, in the garden. Abundant life. Amen. Amen. So if you are just living and just having a simple life, you are short of the glory of God. You are not walking in the full authority of God. Because when you are walking in the full authority of God, you are walking in the abundant life of God. When you are walking in the abundant life of God, you will know. When you are walking in the abundant life of God, you will know. So if you, want, if you have a question for me and say, how do I know I'm walking in the abundant life of God? If you ask me that question, I'll tell you, you don't know yet. Because you are not walking in it. You see, when you're walking in the abundant life of God, you will know. When you're walking in the abundant life of God, you will know. When you're walking in the abundant life of God, you will know. Because the rivers will part for you. Because promotion will never be finished from your house. Because you will rise from glory unto glory. Because everything you touch with your hand will flourish. Because you will not easily just go to a pastor and say, Hey man, there's some, there are demons chasing me in my dreams. Because when you see demons in your dream and you wake up, you will laugh. You will say, I am walking in the abundant life of God. Nothing shall by any means touch my life. You know, when men begin to talk about you, you will laugh. You say, you have no idea who I'm walking with. You want to talk about me? Hey, come on, go ahead and talk about me. I am walking in a different level. I am walking on another plane. When you're walking in a bundle of God, you, not, you see, you won't take notice of the gossip. You, exactly, advertisement. Did you see her shoes? Yes, she had shoes on. That's why you saw it. That's not a gossip. Amen. That's the reality. Did you see her husband though? She, she's married. Oh my goodness, the Bible says that none shall lack their mate. So she found her mate. She's walking in the abundant life of God. So hey, advertise it. Hey, did you see Brother Jay? Brother Jay just bought a jet, man. Amen. When you're walking in the abundant life of God, when you see your brother falling, you will not rejoice. You cannot rejoice. When you see your brother suffering, there is no way you can go to bed and sleep. All of your night, you'll be thinking, how can I help him? How can I lift him up? How can I support him? What can I do? You know what? There are people on a daily basis who reach out to me from Facebook with their problems. My worst comes when I can't help them. I have gone to bed and I have knelt by my bed and I have wept. I say, God, please bless me so I can bless these people. I have begged God. I say, God, make me a millionaire. I will not buy jets and yachts. I said, God, make me a millionaire. Make me a billionaire. I will not just go build big houses and live in. I want to help. When I see kids suffer, it is the worst agony of my life. When I see women in distress, it is the worst of my life. Amen. 
I'm not sure if that's the abundant life, but there is something inside of me that is always yearning for something outside of me. There is something in my heart that is always looking out for the next person. I don't really care what I wear. <laughs> this suit is about six years old. I don't really care about it. This shirt is about four years old. I don't really care about it. I have shirts in my closet that I still wear that are 10 years old. Those of you who know me, those who know me, <laughs> I have no idea when I last bought a shirt. <laughs> People buy them for me. When people say, man, this shirt is too old, man. I said, listen, I don't, I don't need a shirt. And then they'll just go and dump them. Amen. So walk in an abundant life of God. It is beautiful. It is the beginning of God's wisdom inside of you. It is the beginning of the manifestation of God inside of you. It is a mark that tells you you are walking his will. Amen and amen. This message, I can't finish it. I'll leave the other part, the fun part, for another day. Because I feel the presence of God here. And I want to do something else. Amen. Amen. Let me hear you, man. Play something. So begin to walk in abundance of God. Begin to walk in the supernatural abundance of God. There is a thing like divine health. It exists. There is a thing as you're waking up in the morning and you have no need and you have no lack because you are satisfied and you are content in your spirit. There is a thing as supernatural peace. But in all of your life, there is joy inside of you. Because that joy is coming from a place of satisfaction in your belly. Bible says that out of your bellies will flow what? Streams of living waters. How can streams of living water flow out of your belly and not water yourself? It's impossible. Bible says that if the clouds be filled, they pour themselves onto the earth as rain. So how can rain come out of the clouds with the clouds not being filled? How can you bless someone when you are not a blessing? You can only bless someone when you are a blessing. So the fact that you are blessing people means that you are blessed. How can you proclaim the word of God when you don't know the word of God? If it is only one scripture that you know, you know the word of God. Proclaim it. How can you talk about God's presence when you think you don't have the presence of God? He said, I'll be with you to the end of time. So even when you don't feel him by your side, he is with you. When you don't feel him, he is with you. The problem is that you don't feel him. You don't feel him. But he is with you. Saul of Tarsus was killing, murdering, persecuting. But guess what? God was still with him. You see, when the sun rises, the sun rises with new grace with a new mercy, with new blessings, with new provisions for you. And God is not tired of it. Do you know that no two days are the same? No two days can never be the same. No two days can never be the same. So yesterday was different. Today is different. Tomorrow will be different. You know that when the sun rises tomorrow morning, it's different. Because the temperature is different. The humidity is different. Everything is different about tomorrow. So tomorrow is coming with new, fresh blessings for you. Amen.